All right, well, welcome. It's my pleasure today to introduce this special talk by Peter Gallison and Chef Doleman, who serve as the leaders at the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard. As many of you know, the Black Hole Initiative is one of our flagship projects in the mathematical and physical sciences funding area. Um, first off, I want to pause to acknowledge and thank a few people who had the creative vision for launching the BHI back in 2016 and, and before that. Back then, Shep was already leading uh, an effort to capture images of black holes by creating what's called the Event Horizon Telescope, which we'll hear about. And Ashley Zauderer was leading the MPS efforts here at JTF. Ashley worked closely with Avi Loeb and Shep and Peter and others at Harvard to develop the idea of this interdisciplinary center dedicated to the study of black holes. Those efforts also put JTF in contact with other funding entities that were supporting the Event Horizon Telescope. And this eventually led to a fruitful co-funding partnership that persists to this day with between JTF and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So we're grateful to Ashley for all of that early groundbreaking work, and then also to the Moore Foundation for continuing to partner with us in supporting the BHI. Shep and Peter are here today to share a few more recent highlights from the BHI. So let me give you a very brief introduction to each of them. I won't list all of the titles and awards that they've accumulated. Uh, for that, you can read Wikipedia or many other websites. For our purposes, it's enough to highlight the interdisciplinary capacity and the expansive scientific vision that they bring to the table. Many of you know that in addition to being an accomplished physicist, Peter Gallison is an acclaimed historian, philosopher, and filmmaker. His work on all of those fronts uh, addresses this question of how people create knowledge and how the scientific enterprise depends on things like the capacity of, of humans to imagine. What is human imagination and how, how does it depend on our ability to interpret images, for instance, and how is it fed by the broader social and cultural context that we live in? And it makes sense that the BHI would have a director who is attentive to the way that discovery can depend on social and cultural context. Because as you'll hear today, the BHI itself is carefully designed to create a culture of discovery. Uh, building a discovery-oriented culture has also been one of Shep's main concerns for the past many years. That had to be the case in order for him to rally this huge cadre of scientists from all over the world to pursue this bold idea of combining signals from radio dishes across the whole globe to create images of black holes. It was nearly five years ago now that um, when we, we first saw that iconic image uh, that hit the news back in April of 2019, I think the whole world gasped with a big wow, just in awe of that, that image. Maybe you remember that day, that image of uh, the black hole at the center of galaxy M87. So Shep will tell us more about that wonderful image and also about what it takes to create such a thing. Uh, Shep and Peter, welcome. We're so glad you're here. The floor is yours. Turn off this video here, the slider. Say it again? The slider for the video. Should I put it this way? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Perfect. Can everybody hear me? Okay. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I mentioned that this was the holy of holies for us. <laughs> uh, this is a place where we have been supported and where discoveries have been catalyzed for everything that we do. So it's really special for us to be here in this time and place to tell you about what we've done. The Event Horizon Telescope, this idea of imaging black holes, illuminating space time, was motivated by some of the biggest questions we can ask. Like, was Einstein right? Uh, could we make an image of a black hole? How do black holes affect the night sky? How do they shape the structure of the universe? And you know you're on to a really big question when you are directed to a clear course of action. 
in imaging a black hole for us was that course of action. If we could do this, and it had never been done before, we'd be able to test Einstein's theory in the most intense natural crucible that nature offers, the edge of a black hole, and we'd be able to test theories of physics that govern the plasma and the hot gas around the black hole. Why do they shine? So we were motivated by these deep, deep questions. And I want to point out that you know, we're supported by the Templeton Foundation here, the National Science Foundation, and the Moore Foundation. It takes a real group to create a foundation for this kind of work. So I want to start off with black holes, and a lot of that begins with this fellow here, Einstein. Uh, he came with a different concept of gravity, asking, uh, instead of action at a distance, how do we deform space-time, shown here, and have objects move in that deformed space-time, right? So we completely reconceptualize gravity. And just the next year, Schwarzschild solved Einstein's equations, famously on the front in World War I, with artillery shells going back and forth, and he solved this equation. And he said, if you have a point mass, you wind up with this event horizon, a point around that mass where even light can't escape. So it's a one-way door in nature and astronomy. And this is then unfolded into an entire field of inquiry and observations in astronomy. So the idea was, could we see something like this? Now, a lot of observational evidence has come to light that says black holes do exist. So a few years ago, it was still a little speculative, but there was a lot of evidence. And one of the best cases that we had was a galaxy like this. This is Hercules A. It's about 2 billion light years away. You're seeing the optical light here. But if you look at it in radio goggles, you see something entirely different. You see jets of material that stream millions of light years from the center of this galaxy. And the only thing that we know that could be powering that would be a spinning supermassive black hole weighing 4 billion times what our sun does. Magnetic field lines trapped by the disk of material feeding the black hole, then twist and like a bead on a wire, charged particles are flung out at near light speeds. So you wind up with these two oppositely directed jets. This is one of the most powerful, powerful phenomena in the, the night sky. Now, how do black holes shine? I've told you that there's an event horizon and light can't escape. What happens is all the gas is trying to get into an impossibly small region and it heats up to hundreds of billions of degrees. And that is what shines before it descends through the event horizon. And to bring that into perspective, imagine you had an apple and I dropped it from this height. It would release about one joule of energy when it hit the ground. That's enough to power your cell phone for about a second. But imagine now you compress the earth into a size of a marble. That would make it a black hole. So around that little marble, light could not escape. And if you drop the apple from the same distance, this is the radius of the earth here, it would fall and approach the speed of light. And when it hit that event horizon, it would be going so fast, it would release 10,000 trillion times the energy that released here. That's enough to power all of Manhattan for a full year. So this is how black holes, by the nature of space-time that they warp, allow gravitational potential energy to be converted into immense luminosity. They can be some of the brightest objects in the night sky in a paradox of their own gravity. So what, what would these look like? Well, the, all the hot gas around the black hole shown here gets lensed around. And so from our perspective, you wind up seeing a ring of light around the black hole. So essentially, all the light would fall into the event horizon, but light lensed around forms a ring. And the size of that ring, if you solve Einstein's field equations, which I'm sure everyone has in this audience, and uh, who doesn't, you wind up finding that this, the diameter of this ring is equal to the square root of 27 times the Schwarzschild radius, a handful of constants in nature and the mass of the black hole. If we could image this, we would be able to test Einstein's theory in the one place in the universe where we think it could break down. And a number of groups have worked on the simulations of this, asking themselves, what would a black hole look like based on this kind of theory? Now, how do you make a telescope that can see something this small? Because black holes are the smallest objects predicted by Einstein's theory of gravity. 
So we have a couple of cases. There's Sagittarius A star in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. It weighs four million times what our sun does, but it would only be 50 micro arc seconds across. And the center of M87, the image that I showed you at the very beginning, that's only 40 micro arc seconds across. That's like being able to read the date on a quarter in New York from where we are now, or like being able to see an atom held at arm's length clearly. So we're asking to create a telescope that has the greatest resolving power of anything ever devised. Now we do this not by making one telescope because that would just be impossible to make a telescope as big as the earth, which is what we require. But we do this using this technique called very long baseline interferometry. Where we take radio telescopes separated by intercontinental distances. We record data time tagged by hydrogen maser clocks. These are atomic clocks that lose only one second every 10 million years. So all the radio waves are, are registered to within nanoseconds. And then we put them on hard disk drives and we drive them or fly them to a central correlation facility. So we recreate in silicon in a supercomputer what an optical dish does just by the shape of its parabolic dish, okay? And by this method, we're able to get uh, angular resolution of 27 micro arc seconds, which is enough to make these images. So we're creating an Earth-sized telescope. And thankfully, the Earth rotates because we only have a few of these telescopes around the globe. But as we rotate the Earth, every connection between a pair of telescopes gives you one data point. And you can see here as the Earth turns, I hope you can see the red dots moving along here, the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope, weaves an orb, but weaves a web of reflectivity that creates a virtual lens the size of the Earth. So this shows you how we're filling in an Earth-sized lens. And we have many dishes around the globe, and we have enough dishes to start making these images. This was the case in 2017. And we launched an observing campaign in April 2017. All these sites got together, and over a course of about a week, we took an extraordinary treasure trove of data and we were able to make the first image of a black hole. Now we had all of our data, but we had never imaged a black hole before. So we split ourselves up into four separate independent teams. We had the team mostly in the Americas, in Europe, that spanned all the way to East Asia and also in South America. And we asked everyone only to look at the data without sharing their results, because we wanted to make sure that we didn't have groupthink affecting the kind of science we were doing. And the reason we do this is because it's very difficult to tell the difference between labradoodles and fried chicken. We didn't want to be in a situation where everyone is thinking it's a labradoodle, but it's actually it's fried chicken. And you can get you can fool yourself into thinking that And if you think that's difficult, Chihuahuas and blueberry muffins are literally impossible uh, to tell apart. Now, I, I know we're all laughing, but this is a real effect in science. You know, you can easily get into a room and everyone becomes part of an echo chamber. We did not want that to happen. Now, July 24th, 2018, about 18 months after we'd taken the data, all four teams came together at the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard, and every one of them, saw this ring. And that's when we knew from four independent teams that we had a breakthrough on our hands. And I, I'd love to show this picture. This is an important picture for a couple of reasons. First, there are people in this room from all over the globe, from Japan, from China, uh, from South America, from the US, from Europe, and we're all sharing in this moment. The second important thing about this image is that it was taken at the BHI. This is in the basement of the BHI building. So the BHI and the Black Hole Initiative has been at the key center of this breakthrough at every stage. So the EHT discoveries so far, well, just by the numbers, we have 7,000 citations of just this work. So it's rippled across many fields of science, even, even history and philosophy. For the M87 result, we've measured the mass of this black hole to be 6.5 billion solar masses, and that matches the expected mass from other techniques. So we've verified Einstein at the black hole boundary. And we've confirmed that the shadow exists. 
We then came a couple of years later and looked at this same image with polarized glasses and those magnetic fields I was describing before that cause these jets of material. We've now seen the very structure of those magnetic fields at the boundary of the event horizon. So now we know that all of the computer simulations we've been running for a long time are based in real observations. And then just a couple of years later, we came with the first image of the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. This is special because it's in our backyard. And this paves the way to even better and more precise tests of Einstein's theory, because unlike this object where we know the mass to some precision, let's say 20%, here we know the mass better than 1%. So here, measuring the size of this ring gives us a much better idea of uh, the precision of Einstein's theory. So this big question allowed us to ask the next big questions. So the other way you know you're onto a big question is, does it give you the language? Does it give you the framework to ask, ask the next set of questions? So we've seen this object here, but we know that M87, this galaxy, is a much larger object. And there are jets of material coming out of that central galaxy. And we have not yet made the connection between the circle of light and the jet that leads. And this is one of the key questions in modern astrophysics. How are jets powered, right? How do they turn this infalling gravitational energy into these blowtorches that stretch across entire galaxies? In addition, we know that black holes breathe. They live, they're evolving. They're, lo they're living objects in a certain way. And we'd like to make movies of black holes to understand the dynamics. And then last, the ring of light that you've seen has fine substructure. So there are more and even deeper tests of Einstein that we can ask by looking not at light that shows to us, light that makes an orbit around the black hole, and even light that makes multiple orbits around the black hole. And that's something that Peter will be describing a little bit later. Now, the key to making the next set of images is shown here. This basically shows you the coverage we have across the entire globe. This is basically the lens that we have that's the size of the Earth. The thing that limits us the most are these holes. We need to fill in the holes of the Earth-sized virtual lens to take the next step. And that's what the next generation EHT, which I'll tell you about now, is aimed towards. So we asked ourselves, let's go beyond the existing dishes that we have. Where would we put the next set of telescopes, right? And this, we're like, we're like kids in a candy store now, right? Because the EHT, the special sauce, was taking bespoke tailored electronics to existing telescopes and binding them together in a, to do something that no one of them could have done on its own. And now we're asking ourselves, where would we put brand new telescopes? We've surveyed many, many sites around the globe. The blue points here are where we have telescopes now, and the red is where we might hope to put new telescopes. And we've come with four key locations, the Canary Islands, Baja, California, Las Campanas in Chile, and a site in Wyoming that optimize our ability to make movies of black holes. And so one of our postdocs, Don Pesci, has done an exhaustive analytic study here. We looked at triangles that link South America to North America, up to Greenland. We looked at triangles that linked Europe to South America, even down to Antarctica, and globes spanning Antarctica to Greenland triangles. And we focused on this one. This that links to Canary Islands, the Western US, and South America. And this gives us the best performance of adding a few telescopes to the array. So what will this give us? Well, here's where we are now. In 2023, we were able to field this kind of array. So we're filling in a lot of the Earth-sized virtual lens. But now adding these key sites and adding more frequencies gives us much, much better coverage. And in the future, we'll get even better. So we're adding telescopes in Korea, Africa, and more in South America. So we're filling in this Earth-sized virtual lens and we can make movies now. And I wanna also point out that we're exploring uh, a very exciting site in the saddle of Kilimanjaro between these two peaks, not on the top of either one of these, but this plateau here is already 4,700 meters high above most of the water vapor on the Earth. This would be a fantastic site and we are very interested in doing this kind of astronomy from the roof of Africa. And we're working with the Open University of Tanzania to make that happen. 
So what can we do? Well, we can make real-time movies of Sagittarius A star. So on the left, you're going to see the changing coverage moment to moment of the Earth-sized virtual lens. This is the truth image. This is what uh, a hot spot orbiting the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy would look like. And this is a reconstruction based on some software that one of our postdocs has made. And you can see that over time, the coverage changes, but we're able to reconstruct the orbiting hotspot. Now, this is important because everything I've showed you so far is light bending around the black hole. But this is the motion of matter around the black hole. Matter cannot move at the speed of light. So it's a completely different test of Einstein's theory to look at the motions of hot gas around the black hole. And then how do we connect the black hole to that jet that I was showing you? Well, this is a computer simulation. And this shows here the image we'll be able to make with the next generation EHT. We'll be able to link the faint jet emission to the bright emission around the black hole and solve this deep mystery of how these electrical currents around the black hole give rise to this jet. But what I really love about this project is we'll be able to make the first movie of this entire system. Now, what you're seeing here is frames taken every three days. You make a movie, or you may make an image in, over a three-day period, and you stack these. There's nothing fancy here. We're just making frame after frame and playing it. And you can wind up seeing the spiral structure from the region right around the black hole flow all the way through the jet. This will be the key to understanding how black holes shape our night sky. I want to come to a conclusion here by saying a few general things about what we've done. So I've told you how we got started, a little bit about how we did it, the results, and where we're going with the next generation EHT. But the BHI has been at the center of this discovery. So we've done something that people have not done before. I think this is one of the great observational breakthroughs of our generation in astronomy. And the impact was huge. This was on the cover of every major newspaper around the globe. And we did it as a team. So when I think about the import of this project, it's not just the science, which has been foundational, but it's also the social impact. I got into cabs on April 11th in 2019, and I would just ask, hey, have you heard about this black hole thing? And the cabbie would turn to me and say, like, absolutely. And he would start to explain it to me. This actually happened. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just played dumb. I was like, really? Like, how do they do that? And he was like, haven't you been reading the news? You're like, this is big, right? So people had some ownership of it. And I think one of the reasons they had ownership of it was because everywhere you're standing, you're on the Event Horizon Telescope. We use the Earth itself as the armature to create an instrument that could see a black hole for the first time. And I think that has imbued everyone on the planet with a sense of belonging to this project. Whether they know it or not, they're on the telescope. They're walking on our instrument. Beyond that, we created a team that drew expertise from all over the globe. So we nimbly sidestepped all the issues that tend to divide us as people. And we focused on a common scientific goal. And I think that also draws people to this project. And, and it also linked with literature, with movies. We all have some idea of, of astronomy and black holes from, these, from the arts, and this tapped into that. I was asking Heather a little while ago when she fell in love with astronomy. I'm, I'm assuming everyone here loves astronomy, like whether it was during summer camp, looking up at the night sky, seeing a, a total solar eclipse, which was my entree into astronomy in 1980. Um, whether you saw a book or had an inspiring teacher, we all have a deep connection with this. And so it has been a real pleasure to do the science, but also to connect broadly with humanity on this, on this project. So I'll, I'll end by saying that I think the next generation EHT, the next step, will be as transformational as the EHT was. It'll be another revolution. Uh, we hope to have new instrumentation for multicolor capability not observing in one frequency, but multiple frequencies. We'll have a first prototype station in the Canary Islands. We're targeting that for 2026, so we're making rapid progress. 
and three additional sites coming in 2029. We've put in a new proposal to the National Science Foundation for all the marbles, and we'll see how that goes. Um, but we also can do things in a modular way at about $8 million per site. And I'm convinced, uh, just as I was convinced that we would be able to take an image of a black hole uh, in the last decade, that we'll be able to make the first movie of a black hole in 2030. Thank you very much. So I want to zero in on a structure that Shep mentioned and that builds on the next generation event horizon telescope called the photon ring. So what we're seeing mostly in the famous first pictures of the black hole is hot gas that's orbiting around the black hole, billion degree gas uh, or plasma. And, but within that, if you could peer into it, you would see a thin bright ring that's just pure light that's trapped orbiting around the black hole. The black hole is so powerful in its gravitational field that light itself goes into orbit. But let me start by just saying something about the BHI, the Black Hole Initiative, which the Templeton Foundation has played such a crucial role in developing. There are eight of us principal investigators. Uh, we began thinking about this in 2015. It opened officially in 2016. We started a program of postdoctoral fellows, graduate students. And you can see just one amplifying effect of this. We have those postdoctoral fellows there, there are nine of them, and there are seven at the moment who have just come with other funding who wanna work with us. So it's almost doubled the effect of the postdocs who are there. And then if you look at what's happened with them, right now we have four graduate students, but there are 20 former postdoctoral fellows who've gone through the program of three-year appointments. Nine are now faculty members at major colleges and universities around the world. 11 have continued as postdoctoral researchers, researchers, and of our former 21 graduate students, six are now already faculty members. So it's been a spectacular springboard for people to, to launch from. And it's allowed collaborative work, imaginative new combinations of mathematics and physics, astronomy, philosophy, in all sorts of ways. Just to give you an idea of the productivity of the place, we have over 427 papers that have come out of the BHI. Uh, 338 are already refereed. The greens are still, many of them still in process of being uh, refereed. The, the amplification effect is enormous as you go from 2017 to 2023. And over the last years, it's coalesced around four fundamentally interdisciplinary projects, projects that in a way gain power uh, from the BHI in, in its roles. There's the, um, the movies that are the one of the main aiming points of the next generation Event Horizon Telescope, as Shep has uh, outlined uh, for, for us already today. There's another domain called holography, which is this amazing discovery that gravity inside a domain, a black hole, for example, is completely captured by ordinary quantum mechanics on the surface. That correspondence makes it possible to calculate things that would have been entirely beyond our capacity at the fundamental level at gravity. But because like a hologram that you can hold in your hand uh, that captures a three-dimensional scene and you can look and see behind things, the exterior reflects the interior. And that's been developed by Andy Strominger, and Engelhardt, and then many of their students, they've got a big grant to pursue this. Um, the bridging the scales, an effort led by Ramesh Narayan and, and Priya Natarajan, goes as you know, Shep described the scales, you go from the bright spot at the upper left where the black hole is through these jets that cover the size of galaxies. So something that's the size of the solar system can affect things that are millions of times bigger. So that possibility means simulating the physics of intense gravity near a black hole with a medium extent with what happens all the way on the other side or even another galaxy away. To bring those together requires interdisciplinary assembly of knowledge 
to be able to have one unified way of simulating what's going on, which is what they're after. And then there's the photon ray, this remarkable universal phenomenon that every black hole has of creating uh, an orbit of light, a ring of light that tells you everything about the black hole. It is a kind of hologram of the black hole. So it tells us about the nature of space and time. It answers a fundamental problem in, in, in physics as well as astronomy. So again, this, this, the, a piece of this was shown to you already, already by, by Shep, I know I should stand here. Uh, and there these direct light is bent for either from the gas and lensed around the black hole or coming in and then gently bent by it. And that's sort of the basis of the most of the image that we've seen already. But you can have these more complicated orbits where photons come in from anywhere in the universe, get and actually go into orbit, and some of them escape. Some of them fall into the black hole, some of them just go off to infinity. But there's this critical curve, delicate balance between of, of chaos where even a slight motion to the right, right or the left will send you either plunging into the black hole if you're a photon or out to infinity. And we're after that. This is a little a clip from a, uh, a little film that I made. There's a longer film called The Edge of All We Know that you can see on Netflix. But this is a, a, a new mission. We're trying to make a space mission to send a satellite up to extend the size of the virtual telescope that Chep has described and would use that to all the way out to space distances to make something not the size of the Earth, but several times larger. There's something about us as human beings that we really want to know what's out there in the universe. And I think like a billion people saw the first image of the black holes. And I think we just want to know more. But most of what we saw in that picture was gas circulating around the black hole. We would like to understand the properties of the black hole itself. It turns out that there is a really elegant, beautiful, and simple way of doing that. The black hole space-time itself actually creates a way of studying black holes in an entirely new way. Black holes are where you have the strongest gravity. Light rays are bent around, are bent around by a lot can even make a circle around the black hole. And this leaves certain signatures in the image of the black hole. The photon ring. Those photons tell you everything about the nature of the black hole. We'll be able to probe principles of general relativity, gravity, and how the universe works on scales not before seeing. They've already created the largest telescope. Now they need to make it even bigger. We realize that we'll never be able to do this science from the ground. Earth is not big enough. So when it says everything, there, there are two fundamental things about black holes. There's not very much you can say about them in, in a certain way. How much they weigh, that is to how big they are, and how fast they're spinning. So what we can do is we can make an image, this black ring, of what the size of the black hole would be as measured by the motion of stars around it, which, which led to the Nobel Prize for Andrea Ghez and Reinhard Genzel, and then compare it to what happens when you spin. And if, if the black hole is spinning, it looks like its diameter is reduced. So just by measuring its size, we'll be able to say something about the spinning aspect of the black hole, which has never been done at the center of the Milky Way, for example. And this is a fundamental part of the world. Black holes are, there is a giant black hole at the center of every galaxy of the 100 billion galaxies in the, in the visible universe. And they're kind of the edge of the universe. The edge of a black hole is an edge of the universe. And so we're probing what space and time are like towards the edge of the universe, which is 
a wonderful ambition to have. The team for this space mission involves many different people from lots of different places. We have a team in Japan that's growing like uh, Topsy. There's John Mathers, a Nobel Prize winner. And much of the J James Webb Telescope team has been excited to join. We've been collaborating with the Goddard Space Flight Center, with uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Um, so it's it's all it's it's growing as an international collaboration uh, uh, from from. It takes the resources of a myriad of disciplines to be able to do this. And this work really couldn't have ha launched without the Black Hole Initiative. It was because we had fundamental physics, astronomy, all these other disciplines together that we could write the paper in 2019, 2020, which, um, which launched this. There are now over a thousand papers referring to that, that initial paper on black hole. black hole science in the form of the photon ring science has become a huge uh, and exciting growth area in, in, in physics and astronomy. At the Goddard Space Flight, Space Flight Center, uh, just a couple of months ago, we had a team looking at, at, uh, uh, at antennas. We're trying to take each of the subsystems. We're have partnering with places in Europe and Japan and the United States and putting together the team necessary to build the, the parts of this proposed satellite. So the satellite's orbiting about 12,000 miles from the Earth, and it's linking up to the Earth stations that Shep described, the next generation of Horizon Telescope, and then it's got to get this data down, like a, a library size amount of information every night. So you need to do that. You can't send it by radio. It's too slow. Or it's, not, it's not efficient enough to transport it. So you need a laser. And there is, happily enough, uh, a, a laser that can communicate this, and it's flying at a couple hundred miles above the Earth now, run by Lincoln Labs, and it's called T-Bird, and um, that was a terabyte uh, infrared delivery system. So we know it can work. We need to make it work at 12,000 miles, not 300, so we've got to power it up. And one of the things we're doing now is, is, is gathering the forces and raising the money to be able to build the amplifier to drive that laser to be able to downlink this massive amount of information. You can't store it in space because storage devices don't like being in space. They get bombarded by cosmic rays and things and they, they, they don't do well. Or if you, sh if you shield it, then it weighs so much at a million dollars a kilo, you don't want to lift them up. You don't want to take, just ship a lot of lead up into orbit. So this slide shows you the satellite linking to the various, um, to the various sites on the Earth uh, through the blue lines and the connections among the earthbound stations are in red. And you can see night and day, you see the satellite moving uh, through, uh, through over the course. This is simulated for 2030, where if all goes well, we hope to launch around 2032, which would fit in nicely to the schedule that Shep and the NGHT are aiming for, uh, where, uh, so that that could, um, that, that, that really works out very well. Now I just want to say something about the philosophy of, <laughs> of this all, because there's something amazing about the photon ring. It's actually a series of rings, like yeah, each one corresponding a little bit narrower than the one before, corresponds to just being gently bent by the black hole, going around once, going around twice, going around three times. So you could think of this the following way. If you had a, a bunch of a, a person, say, on Earth, and their photons were bouncing off of them and going up and go, go to the black hole, the older person would might be bent and come to the observer where that eye is on the top, uh, top frame. You know, an adult, uh, a young adult, might, might, the photons might go and go around once and then go to the observer. But because it's been stored there, it comes from an earlier phase of the life of this one person. And the baby of that same person uh, could have been gone around a couple of times and then gone to the observer. So if we see the first ring, the second ring, the third ring, we're actually sampling from the whole visible universe at progressively older times. So as you go from just being gently bent to going around once, to going around twice, to going around three times. If you had the eyes of a cosmic lynx, you would actually see the frames of a movie of the whole history of the visible universe. This is the ultimate universal archive. It's a movie of the history 
of the universe. Everything that the black hole can see, that is everything that can see the black hole, is in some sense recorded. Now, don't try this at home. It's not a practical proposal, but in principle, it raises this philosophical notion of a kind of ancient human desire that there, that somehow we will be preserved. Everything in all of history, even before humanity and long after, is being preserved around these black hole cameras, so to speak. Uh, let me just come to the end here. I want to show you uh, another clip from the little film. This whole project is light all the way down from the black hole to the satellite. Looking at just pure light, the way it moves conveys the geometry of space and time itself. A powerful jet emitting so much. We do not have a complete theory of how to describe a black uh, hole. This experiment is an exciting step in that direction. We finally have technology good enough. Now's the time. Strike while the iron is hot. This is actually the inception point. And I get to be on the ground floor. We're looking at something like a three and a half meter aperture. We're trying to lead it, trying to be responsible for the vision and, and make sure that we're going after something that, that really can be done. It's thrilling to have that opportunity. The photon rings illuminate the geometry of our universe. That seems to me something worth fighting for. It's a 10, 12 year project, requires a certain amount of optimism and hope. And something I really believe in. That's how knowledge evolves in bits and pieces with the contribution of hundreds of thousands of people. And I'm just happy to be a part of it. Eight, seven, six, Five, yep, this is why four. I get up in the morning and I can see, I can see clearly what we're going to see. And, and, and every day I think, yep, we're getting, we're getting one step closer Three, to that. Two, one. So we're trying to imagine that the satellite that's going to go up multiply by three the acuity of our virtual telescope, allow us to pluck this thin ring from the larger structure around the black hole to show us something about the very nature of space and time. And it begins here with the, with, with the Templeton Foundation support of the BHI that's allowed us to put together this exciting sequence from Event Horizon Telescope, next generation Event Horizon Telescope, to the Black Hole Explorer, we are delighted, proud, and grateful for your support. So thank you.